Welcome back. I hope that you enjoyed exploring the new major five finger patterns that we learned last time, and that you have been able to get the melodic tune to our goal tempo hands together. Hopefully, you are starting to familiarize yourself with the landmark pitches on the staff, and you tried to connect what you already know about the Ode to Joy and melodic tune pitches to those notes on the staff. So let's begin by reviewing the melodic tune together. We'll play it straight through together at our goal tempo so you can assess your performance by comparing it to mine. One, two, three, ready, play. Were you able to stay on track and keep playing with me, even if you made a few mistakes? If you made a few mistakes, were these in predictable places where you almost always have trouble? If so, this is an indication that you'll want to isolate these problem spots and practice them until you can play them with ease, before integrating them back into the entire piece. You might make a note of these places on your score, so you can go back to them during your practice after our lesson today. Now, I'd like to try the melodic tune together again, but I'll add some extra accompaniment notes to fill it out a little. I'll still be playing your melody to help you keep on track. You may use either the off-staff version in your music book or the notated version on the staff. It's your choice right now. One, two, three, ready, play. So how did you do that time? It can be more challenging to stay with me when you hear additional notes in the accompaniment. If you'd like another shot at it, feel free to back up the video and try it with me as many times as needed to achieve success. Once you've played it successfully, we'll take a closer look at the notated score. Because you know this piece, now if we look at the notes on the staff, they might be more meaningful for you. First, it begins with repeated E's, a skip or a third below landmark G. Skips are easily recognizable on the staff because the notes go from a line to the next line or a space to the next space. Remember, when you skip a note or pitch, you also skip a finger. Then, on beat two of measure two, the melody skips down a third to C and it skips back up to E and up again to landmark G. The second line, or second phrase of the music, features mostly repeated notes and seconds. The seconds move from one space to the next line. In the case at the end of measure six to the downbeat of measure seven, the notes step down. The trickiest phrase is the last one. There is a combination of seconds and thirds, and you have to look ahead and try to prepare the correct fingers in time to play the correct notes. In earlier lessons, we practiced the dynamics for the etude and the ode to joy. Take a moment now to notice where there are fortes and pianos notated on this score. Playing these dynamic contrasts will make the overall performance more effective. Although not noted here, if we apply what we learned in our other pieces, you might realize that you'll also want to keep the left-hand harmony notes a little softer than the melody. I'll let you practice reading the notation and incorporating the dynamics before the next lesson. Now that we've played the melodic tune, let's do a quick review of our major five-finger patterns. I won't review C major today, but let's play G major together and repeat the scale both up and down twice before stopping. One, two, ready, play. Now 
let's review D major and repeat it. Ready, play. So here's how D major will look on the staff, in case you'd like to refer to the notation. Next, let's figure out our A major and E major five-finger patterns. For A major, we'll begin on A. So left hand finger five and right hand finger one will be on A. Feel free to play and say the note names out loud with me. It will help you to reinforce these note names. From A, we go up a whole step to B, up to B. Then we go up a whole step to C sharp, from B to C sharp. Did you catch that one? Half a step higher to the very next note above C sharp is D, C sharp to D. And a whole step above D is E, from D to E. So does your hand position look like mine? If so, let's try it together, and as usual, we'll repeat it. I'll go a little slower this time. One, two, and play. A, B, C sharp, D, E. And play again. This is how A major looks on each staff. In the treble clef, notice that the A is placed a second above landmark G, then the notes move upward on the staff from a space to the next line, then to the next space and line and ending on a space, before turning around and descending by step on the staff. In the bass clef, the first note A begins on the next line above landmark F. Note that this is a third above landmark F. Remember, when you go from a line up to the next line, you'll be ascending by an interval of a third. After the A, we move up by step to B in the space above the staff. Then you'll see we add a tiny snippet of a line above the B. This snippet of a line is called a ledger line. We'll talk more about ledger lines in a few minutes. This first ledger line above the bass clef staff is middle C. Then we continue just as if we had another line on our staff, so the middle D is on the space above the ledger line. Okay, so let's figure out one more major five-finger pattern that you can add to your warm-up routine. Take a moment and try to figure out the left hand of E major on your piano. Now, let's talk through it. On the keyboard, the left hand, finger five, will be on E. This is a whole step above E is F sharp, since there's no black key in between. We know that E to F natural is a half step, so we go another half step to the F sharp to make a whole step. So E to F sharp. Then, a whole step above F sharp is the next black key, G sharp. Again, we skipped the white key to make a whole step here. So F sharp to G sharp. Then a half step higher than G sharp is A. And finally, a whole step above A is B. So let's set up the other hand and we'll play it twice. One, two, and play. E, F sharp, G sharp, A, B. And again, please, E. On the treble clef staff, this is how the E major five-finger pattern looks. The first note, E, is a third below landmark G. Remember, this is the line right below the G line, so it's a third lower. Then we move up to B by step and back down to E by step. Please practice all of these major five-finger patterns before the next lesson. The next concept that I'd like to introduce is a chord. A chord is simply three or more notes played together. 
A three-note chord is also called a triad because it has three tones or notes. Chords are often used to create harmony. To form a triad or a chord, we stack thirds up on top of each other. So, if we stay with E major, we have an E, then a third above that, and another third above that. So, in the left hand, it would look like E, G sharp, B. On the treble clef, it's a line, line, line. You'll see that E is on the bottom, and the thirds are stacked up on top of it. We can play chords in blocked form all at once, like so, or broken, where we play the bottom note, the middle note, the top note, and then go back down. With your right hand, try this with me. We'll play the E major chord broken first, and then blocked. One, two, here we go. E, middle, top, middle, bottom, then block. Now, without looking at the score, let's try this with our left hand. Same thing, broken and then blocked. One, two, here we go. Bottom, middle, top, and block. Did you notice that the chord was just the bottom, the middle, and the top notes of your five-finger pattern? That's part of the reason that we warm up with and drill the five-finger patterns. If you know the major five-finger patterns really well, you'll be able to figure out the major chords quite quickly. So let's create a new warm-up that includes both the five-finger scale and the broken and block chords. Here's our new warm-up. I'll show you in E major. Now, will you try it with me? You can try just one hand if you'd like. One, two, here we go. Broken. Block. How did you do? If you tried both hands and found the coordination tricky, especially when you got to the chord, I assure you this is not unusual. If you are not able to coordinate the hands together yet, I would suggest working on the hands separately and then trying it hands together slowly during your practice sessions. I'd like to look at one more new interval before we move on. It's a fifth. If we take the E major chord and remove the middle note, you'll see that we have an interval of a fifth. So on the piano keys, we would count the bottom note and the top note. One, two, three, four, five, to make the fifth. On the staff, the fifth is easy to spot. It's a line to a line with one line in between. Or it's a space to a space with one space in between. So let's try to find these notes on the keyboard. Hopefully you notice that the bottom note is a step above landmark G, so it's an A. Then, a fifth above A is E, so this fifth is easy to find on the keyboard because it fits under your hand when you are set up in your major five-finger pattern, so you can probably find it fairly easily. Let's see if you can identify an interval in the bass clef. Did you play this? Hopefully you recognized one of our landmark notes, bass C, the low note, and placed your fifth finger on it. Then you might have noticed that the note on top of it was a fifth because we went from a space to a space with one space in between. You can check your top note also by recognizing that it's just a second above landmark F. I want to look at one more interval in the left hand. It's one that you already know, though now it looks different. What interval is this? This might be a little tricky because the notes are almost stacked on top of each other. We go from landmark F to the second above. B 
Because of how the staff is set up, it's impossible to stack the notes of any interval of a second perfectly on top of one another. So we butt them up against one another. If they are whole notes where they receive four counts, they look like this. When seconds get one, two, or three counts, the stem fits between the two notes, like so. So let's try a new left-hand piece that uses fifths, seconds, and some individual notes. I'll play it for you, and you can follow along. Try looking at the notes on the staff, and maybe tap the rhythm with me as I play. One, two, three, four. Now, find your C major hand position and shadow on the keys as I play. One, two, shadow. Fifth, 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 two, three, four. Fifth, 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 two, three, four. Fifth, one, two, three, four. Second, one, two, rest, rest. Fifth, fifth. Rest, rest, skip up, down by step. One, two, three, four. Are you ready to try playing the left hand with me this time? Here we go. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, rest, rest. One, two, rest, rest. Rest, rest, fifth. Fifth, F, F, two, rest, rest. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Now, try that again. I'll still play the left hand with you, but I'm going to add the melody this time. The melody will begin before the left hand, so listen to my verbal cue before bringing in your left hand. One, and ready, play, two, three, four, one. you recognize the tune as When the Saints Go Marching In. I live in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, about an hour outside of New Orleans, so of course I have to teach this piece. Let's look at the score, or the notation, for the right hand now. You'll see that the very first note is on a ledger line. This is our next landmark note, its middle C. It's on that ledger line that we just talked about earlier, but now it's below the treble clef staff. If you think of this ledger line as a snippet of an extra line below the staff, you can see that it's a third below the bottom line or a fifth below landmark G. In other words, this note is a line to a line with one line in between below landmark G. From the first note, middle C, we skip up a third to the next line, or E. Then we move up by step to F, and then landmark G. If you place your hands in C position and use adjacent fingers for the seconds and skip a finger for the thirds, you'll find that everything fits perfectly under your right hand. There's only one other thing to notice. It's called a tie. A tie is a curved line, and the technical name for this is a slur, 
that connects the same pitch across a bar line. The first high is in the right hand of this piece, and it connects the whole note G in measure two to the quarter note G on the downbeat of measure three. When you see this, you will hold the G for five counts total. So you hold the key down and do not lift your hand to play it again on the downbeat of measure three. It's, as we say, tied across the bar line. So here's how you'd clap and count the rhythm in the first three measures. Rest, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Will you clap and count these measures with me now? One, two, three, four, rest, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. There are also ties between the melody notes in measures 4 to 5, 8 to 9, 12 through 13, and 16 through 17. In measures 12 and 13, you'll hold the dotted half and half notes starting on beat 2, like so. 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. In the final two measures, you'll hold the middle C for a total of eight beats. Now, let's shadow the pitches or the notes on the piano keys. As we shadow, we'll say the intervals, so feel free to say those intervals out loud with me. It will help you to learn to recognize them more quickly. Notice that at the beginning, there is a quarter note rest, so I'll whisper one for beat one, and then we'll begin shadowing. Let's do eight measures only, as that makes a good practice segment. So get your hand in place. One, two, three, four, rest. C, E, up a step. G, two, three, four, one. C, E, F, G, hold, three, four, one. C, E, F, G, two, E, two, C, two, E, two, D, two, three, four, one. If you found that tricky, you could pause the video and tap the rhythm with your right hand on your lap, and then shadow the notes again before moving on. But the next practice step is to play the notes in rhythm, slowly for those eight measures. You may join me if you feel ready. Again, the first eight measures. One, two, three, four, one. One, two, three, four, hold. Two, three, four, hold. Down a third, down a third, up a third, down a step. Two, three, four, hold. During your practice, after our lesson, and once you can play the right hand comfortably, try playing the right hand and tapping the left where it is supposed to play. Finally, when you feel ready, try both hands together. Remember, don't play too quickly at first. I'd like to play the entire piece with both hands for you now, so you know how it should sound. Please learn the entire piece before the next lesson, but I'd recommend dividing it into halves to make it more manageable. You probably don't want to work on both halves at each practice session for the first day or so. Give yourself time to learn each section before linking them together. Remember to begin slowly, but ultimately your goal tempo for the next lesson should be about a quarter note equals 132. I'd like to make one final note about reading pitches on the staff. As you may have noted, I encourage you to know your landmark notes really well and to read intervallically. This is a really useful skill when sight reading new music. 
However, you will need to be able to identify individual pitches quickly. There are lots of mnemonic devices and sayings for remembering the bass and treble clef lines. While these are clever, most of my students tend to get the clefs and the sayings mixed up for the line notes because they are so similar. But if you can remember the space notes for each clef, you can quickly move a step higher or lower to name the line pitch next to it. Now, what I mean is that the treble clef spaces from bottom to top spell the word F-A-C-E. If you remember face and then have a pitch on the top line of the treble clef staff, as long as you remember that the fourth space is E, you'll be able to quickly figure out that the pitch a step above E is F. In the bass clef, the space notes are A, C, E, G. If you remember the saying, all cows eat grass, or all cars eat gas, you'll remember the names of the space notes and quickly be able to figure out any of the line notes on the bass clef. So we've covered a lot of ground today. We've learned some new major five finger patterns. Now we know C, D, E, G, and A major five finger patterns and chords. Remember our new practice routine for these. Play the scale, the broken chord, then the blocked chord. We rehearsed our melodic tune, trying to balance the melody, keeping it louder, and the accompaniment or harmony by keeping it a little softer. From now on, when we learn new repertoire, try to be aware of bringing out the melody and notice any dynamic markings noted on the score. Finally, today we worked through a version of When the Saints Go Marching In, which we learned by reading the musical notation on the grand staff. So, for next time, please practice your five-finger scales and chords in C, D, E, G, and A major. Your goal tempo should be a quarter note equals 132. And this is the speed of the accompaniment tracks. Memorize the space notes for the treble and bass clef, face for treble, A-C-E-G for bass clef, Learn when the saints go marching in, and we will return to this in a couple of lessons. So get to know this version. Your goal tempo should be a quarter note equals 132. Also work on the melodic tune hands together with the dynamics and focusing on balancing the melody and the harmony parts. And review anything from our previous sessions that you would like to learn more securely or just play for fun. As you know, you'll find all of this music notated in your music book, and I encourage you to play along with me on the video once you've gotten comfortable with the pieces from this lesson. Playing with me before the lesson will help you to get a sense of where you have succeeded and the spots that might still need some review. As always, use your practice steps, clap, shadow, and play when learning new music or when working on tricky problem spots in your pieces. Take as much time as you need to prepare your assignment before the next lesson. You'll likely need several days or a week. I'll look forward to seeing you again next time. And in the meantime, happy practicing.